Hi, today is Thursday, July 21st, and uh, my name is Dave Gross. I'm here with John Hogeboom, Nancy Grover, and Josh Lackey. And uh, today we have a great show for you. Um, Nancy is going to start off talking about uh, Google malware warning that uh, they've just started uh, doing. And uh, then John is going to go into a topic uh, where there was a DHS study on USB security. Um, so he'll tell us all about that. I'm going to report on a, uh, the ComTouch July Internet Threats Trend Report, give you an idea of what they've been seeing happening in, in the trends. Uh, then Josh is going to talk about the uh, a preview of the Black Hat conference coming up, and John will talk to us about Internet anomalies. So, uh, Nancy, why don't you take it away and tell us about the uh, Google malware warning that's happening now. Sure, sure. Well, a couple of uh, days ago, about a million users um, of using the Google search engine were encountering a, a big yellow banner that you can see on this slide here at the bottom of the slide. It says your computer appears to be infected. And what that was a result of was some weird activity that Google uh, engineers were, were seeing when they shut down some servers in one of their data centers. Um, they had migrated the traffic to other servers, but they kept seeing all of these machines trying to access the server still. Um, so they consulted actually a, a bunch of security people from a bunch of other companies to see what was going on. And what they determined was these computers um, that were trying to reach them had been infected with malware previously. They probably, the, the user either clicked on a link in email or went to a bad site um, and got infected that way. And what was happening with these infected people was that they were being directed to a proxy rather than to Google itself. So they're going to this proxy thinking they're really going to Google, and then what they're presented with in their search results were some bad links um, that you know, contained even more malware or maybe some ransomware trying to get them to pay the money to clean up their computer. So anyway, Google... Um, as, as I said, identified this, and so to about 1 million, though I've seen some of the reports saying upwards of 2 million users um, were given this banner. Uh, what I found really, really interesting was um, Google did say in the blog, which I also have a little bit of the blog right there, um, uh, that the users who encountered this banner should update their antivirus software or get some antivirus software. And if they didn't have any antivirus software, then they should go to Google and search, or do a web search on antivirus. And, and, I, and I just found that kind of odd, thinking these people were already infected and potentially going to, you know, a proxy rather than to Google themselves. It, it just seemed kind of weird. <laughs> I don't know if you guys think that's kind of odd too, but. Anyway, it seems like they've got the problem taken care of. I don't know if they're going to intend to do this going forward, that any time they recognize something odd happening, that they're going to be warning people on a regular basis, or this was just a one-time deal? Well, I think uh, from what I read, this was kind of a low-hanging fruit situation for them, mm -hmm. where this is one of these fake antivirus. Actually, it's a suite of several fake antivirus um, types of malware and they knew what proxy servers they use. Um, so they had a very well-defined list of those, and anytime they see someone you know, transiting from a proxy server into Google, Google knows that they're an infected victim. Mm -hmm. So um, it was pretty easy to do that. Now to do that for all types of malware, probably not as easy. This is one that they're able to do because the victims come through a proxy in order to get their you know, Google search results. So it's easy for them to pick up in that regard. So what do you guys think of uh, the idea of uh, Google or some, you know, end application uh, like that uh, trying to do this sort of thing? Is that the right thing for them to be doing? I, I, did, I thought it was a, a kind of nice of them to do, but again, I just found it odd for them to tell people that you are infected and you are potentially going to bad websites, but here, do a search anyway. I, I don't know what else they would have done, really, um, aside from telling them to get antivirus software. And I, and I do believe they offered a list of legitimate uh, places where they could get that. But I, don't, I, kind of, I kind of thought it was nice of them to do. I, I don't know. what about, If I had seen that, though, 
personally, if I went to Google and, and saw that, I would have thought I was um, that that was not really them. Yeah, I, I would be thinking that too. That uh, this isn't usual behavior for from Google, so it must be something going on, some other kind of uh, malicious activity happening on my machine. Exactly. You got to remember. I mean, the people who have like all these viruses, they're probably not all you know that computer savvy, right? So uh, that the fact that Google's telling them something, they'll just take it at face value, right? And, and which I think is fine. I mean, I. I it is kind of strange for people who know what they're doing, but maybe for people who don't know what they're doing, it's, it's fine. I agree with Nancy, though. I don't know how you could tell, okay, so we can tell that you're getting bad search results, so go search for an antivirus. It's like, wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't make sense. It's a good indicator. I mean, doing any kind of Google search, you know, in the absence of searching for antivirus, because I wouldn't trust those results that you're getting, right? But right. just going there and searching would be a good indicator to let you know that you're infected, and then maybe you'll take some other means. I, I would not trust your Google search results for antivirus to go use that as to install antivirus from, because I've actually seen these infected machines, and those results are definitely very tampered to give you additional malware. It's kind of interesting how they do it. It looks very realistic, too. So. Yeah. And, and the problem I've always had is that to really clean a machine is difficult, and that even if you've got, like, you know, the latest antivirus, all the latest signatures, if your machine's already been infected, it's almost like the only way to be sure of anything now is just to wipe it and start again. So, yeah, I agree. In most cases, that's true. But that's yeah. painful. Yeah, it is. <laughs> we talked about that a couple shows back and, you know, talked about how painful that could be. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, very good. Thank you, Nancy, and uh, thanks, everyone, for the discussion on that. Uh, next, we'll go to John. Uh, he's going to talk about the DHS study on uh, USB security. Yeah, so this was an interesting study that came out um, actually a few weeks ago, um, but it's worth talking about anyway. So the Department of Homeland Security did a, a quick study, and what they did is they went around and dropped USB thumb drives around in parking lots. Um, this is not a new tactic. People have been doing this before as penetration tests, uh, but the Department of Homeland Security did an official report on this. Um, what they found is, is that for these scenarios where they dropped USB thumb drives in parking lots of government buildings or contractors to the government, 60% of them were picked up and inserted into a machine that was a government machine. Um, when, the, uh, when the thumb drive or CD, in some cases they left CDs as well, uh, when either of those had some kind of official logo on it, such as you know, DHS or whatever government organization, 90% uh, of them were actually inserted into workstations. So it's an interesting study. Um, a lot of people have been using this tactic, um, especially the bad guys, to try to get to penetrate into places where they don't have network access to. Um, once they get a machine infected, it can you know phone back out to whatever kind of command and control they they set up. The the key thing I wanted to mention about this is that most of these, although this is not always the case, but most of these use the auto run service in order to install, especially with USB thumb drives. So there's a, a file you can drop on a USB thumb drive. It says auto run. When you insert the thumb drive, it will automatically run whatever that uh, configuration file says to on the thumb drive. So um, Windows has done, a, Microsoft's done a lot of work to um, try to fix this so that machines don't automatically do this. In most cases, people use it as a a beneficial service, so when you insert a CD that might have a device driver software on it or something, it automatically installs the device driver. So that's the legitimate use of it, but bad guys are using it to install their malware silently in the background. Uh, in any event, uh, Microsoft earlier this year um, put out a new patch. Before they had made a patch and they said, install this if you want to. We know it kind of breaks some traditional functionality that you might be liking. Um, such as automatically installing device drivers, but since there's so much bad stuff happening, um, you can install this as you want. In February, they kind of made it a little bit more uh, available directly through Windows Update. Uh, it's not automatically pushed to your machine, but I recommend that if you use Windows XP, disable either A, install that patch, and or disable um, auto run for not only USB thumb drives, CDs, uh, and network shares. We know there's a lot of malware that actually will drop that autorun.inf onto a network share. So 
that when you mount and connect to that network share, it runs and infects your machine that way. And that's how we see big pockets of work groups get infected where um, we, we've actually seen this uh, with customers and uh, other places where uh, a customer, one infected person will get infected with notably Palevo, if people are familiar with that. That's a piece of malware out there. Um, that will drop itself onto a network share that that user is connected to. And now all of his coworkers, when they connect to that same network share, because they all use it to share their documents and whatnot, they all get infected and you get these big breakouts in certain areas where um, people are all using a common network share. So now, off my soapbox. Along with that, I, I've, uh, I know, you know a lot of people have done studies too where you're at a trade show, say, and people are giving out these little drives you know, to be careful even with them, but outside of just tossing it, throwing it away, I guess you're just not, unless you have a sandbox of some sort set up on your computer. Right. Well, there's a couple of things. I would say never insert a thumb drive or CD that you just find laying around somewhere, especially outside or in some public restroom or wherever, you know. Right. If you find something, be very suspicious. I've got like a hundred of these devices. I don't know where I have most, where I got most of them, right? I mean, I've got like a ton of little thumb drives. It's like I'm like, okay, I need some extra space, got to move something. Oh, here's a thumb drive. I'll use it. So, ah, it's 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 hard to put the onus on the user, right? Because like all of us use these devices. So, I mean, I think the correct answer is yes. Windows needs to fix their stuff so it doesn't just automatically run bad stuff when you plug something in. Right. Right. And um, I remember, I think it was uh, a couple of years ago around the, the um, Christmas holiday season uh, where there were uh, a bunch of these uh, picture frames, these uh, digital picture frames that uh, had viruses on it as well. So it's not just thumb drives, but it's anything that can plug into the USB uh, uh, connection. Right. That's correct. Uh, that interesting point because my refrigerator actually has a USB port that you can upload pictures to. Don't ask me why I own this refrigerator. <laughs> I, that's a different... <laughs> that's but so I'm going to go see if I can infect my refrigerator now. That, that's, I think I'll do that right after this I show. I guarantee you can. Um, you have that? You don't have to put magnets and, you know, like your kids' pictures and stuff on there? Yeah, but it's not that cool. No, we still got kid pictures <laughs> all over the fridge, too. Right, but uh, now during this uh, heat wave that we're having is probably not the time to infect your refrigerator. You may wait until this heat, heat wave breaks. Hey, I, I live in Seattle, guys. It's, like, cold here. I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm wearing long sleeves, so I... Uh... Well, one thing I did want to mention lastly is um, one thing you can do to try to help is upgrade to Windows 7. Windows 7 is a lot better about this auto run business. Um, and especially since it has the user account control mechanism in there um, that was kind of introduced in Vista. Um, it's much better, much secure. Nothing's perfect, but it definitely most of these happen on Windows XP. Um, so once you're up to Windows 7, things get a lot uh, safer. And you know what? This is totally, well, sort of off topic, but I just read an article yesterday about Windows 8 and how it will be the end of malware. So I'm interested to see just how that pans out. But Yeah, well, that's what they said about XP before it came out, too. Oh, that's so, true. And, you know, Windows 7 right now is good because uh, it's not that widespread, but I think as time goes on and uh, as the, the uh, uh, people that are creating malware get more familiar with it, there's probably going to be outbreaks of... Um, things on Windows 7 as well, so. We, we could certainly talk about Windows 8 if somebody wanted to. I know, you know, I know at least public details behind the, the design, so, and I agree. I mean, yeah, they're, they're doing things, but it's not like the end of malware, so. Right. All right. Um, well, uh, thank you, John, and uh, let's move on. Um, I'm going to talk about the uh, ComTouch July uh, Internet Threat trend report. Um, basically, I guess uh, ComTouch comes out with a quarterly report giving an idea of what they're seeing in Internet threats. And um, there was something interesting that they found in terms of spam that um, usually when there's a big botnet takedown, there's a drop in spam and then uh, it spikes back up and comes back to its formal levels. 
but since the rust dot takedown, which was back, I believe, in, in March of this year, uh, the spam volumes have been down and have remained lower. And um, so they were uh, surmising that the reason for this is that the uh, spammers are changing their tactics somewhat, partly because of these takedowns and also partly because of some of the new reputation-based uh, analysis that's uh, happening with uh, um, inbound uh, email that instead of using botnets to send out spam, they're now more focusing on using compromised email accounts uh, to send out these spams because those are uh, existing legitimate servers that uh, you know email is coming out from, so it's not initially blocked from uh, uh, from receiving uh, emails. Um, also, they're saying that the botnets are now used more for acquiring these compromised email accounts, uh, getting banking credentials so that they could, you know, sell those off and, and make money that way, and performing DDoS for hire kind of uh, attacks. Um, in terms of the malware trends that they've seen, they've seen um, uh, package delivery notices coming out where it looks like it comes from UPS, FedEx, DHL, or one of the big carriers saying, you know, you received a package, whatever, and click here to get more information, and, and of course and you get infected when you do that. Maybe a month ago or so, I think, John, you talked about yeah. that. Yeah, we had talked about that about a month ago, yep. Right, and there's also, um, there's been um, notices about IRS payments that were rejected, and so, you know, they want you to go to these sites and, you know, potentially fish some of your uh, information. Uh, some of these uh, NACHA payment uh, rejections where this is like uh, online uh, uh, money transfers that have been rejected and, you know, you're afraid your bill hasn't been paid or whatever. Um, also, there's been some uh, search engine uh, poisoning. There was one, uh, this Yehi TV, uh, which has Filipino TV shows, and basically if you looked up uh, this uh, Yay TV, they did poisoning, and so uh, the things that came to the top uh, were uh, links that would lead you to fake antivirus sites and, you know, uh, get you to install this uh, fake antivirus things. And, of course, the, the typical things with the, uh, uh, when there's news that's out there, like the Osama bin Laden, you know, if you want to see that video or the iPhone 5, whatever, take you to these uh, fake uh, um, sites. Also, there were some other things about uh, attacks targeting uh, Facebook users and, and some other phishing attacks. So I just thought it was interesting to talk about the uh, current trends that uh, they had seen. And you know, it's, it's like all the same kind of stuff. I mean, the names might be different, but it all requires somebody pretty much to click on something. Yep, it, it's social engineering. Yes. It's social engineering, but it, uh, they're trying to make it more and more convincing so that uh, more people will click on it. So let's uh, move on to Josh. Josh, you're going to talk about uh, the preview of the Black Hat Conference coming up. Yeah. You know, it's, it's less of a, of a preview and more of just a, a, a list of talks that I was going through. I was going through the Black Hat. I was like, oh, what's interesting in Black Hat this year? And I, I just got a list of talks that were uh, uh, all about the mobile space, so about, like, mobility, mobility networks, things like that. So not a preview because I haven't seen most of these talks, but, uh, but just, like, a list of very interesting ones. So, I mean, we've got things like uh, – War texting, so back in the day, we used to take our modems and we used to dial, like, all the phone numbers we could looking for other computers. And so now they're doing similar things on uh, the mobility network, and so that looked like an interesting talk. But how do you think, so they do war texting, so they, they just text, you know, a block of numbers? Are they, are they seeing if somebody responds? Because, well, I guess if nobody say, if it doesn't exist, you're going to get a, an error message back, potentially that it couldn't send. So I guess it's just a, a way of, of identifying cell phone numbers. So, I, again, I don't know. I haven't seen the talk. There's like a, a <laughs> paragraph about what they're talking about, but I think they're actually trying to identify devices on the mobility network. And so, you know, it's not just 
finding which phone numbers are valid, but which phone numbers actually have computers sitting behind them. So, ah, okay. Uh, oh, and I know that there's also some uh, short codes that you can use to uh, text to uh, a very short number, not a full phone number, and sometimes you can get subscribed to different services or whatever from there. It's uh, 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 definitely could be a very expensive thing if you're if you're uh, trying to uh, 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 war dial a bunch of short numbers, right? Because a lot of them could be like premium SMS numbers. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of crazy. Um, also, there's a talk about femtocells. Uh, you know, I guess last week you guys were discussing a little bit about the Vodafone incident, and so there's actually supposedly new information about femtocells coming out at Black Hat, so that has a lot of potential interest. Mobile malware madness and how to cap the Mad Hatters, so obviously a malware talk. Uh, hacking Androids for profit, so less a mobility network and more a, 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 a cell phone talk, but that, that Probably will have a lot of uh, a lot of interest as well. The profit is a is a big keyword there. Kind of talked about that too, uh, some time, you know, a couple of weeks ago. That I think uh, you, Josh, had had mentioned this this topic. So I guess uh, we're going to go into it more detail than what we already know. Okay, cool. Um, also, uh, arm exploitation for for ROP map. So I think. Uh, it, it, ROP is return-oriented programming, so without going into the details, there, it's just a technique to get around various mitigations. So won't go into the details there. Uh, very interesting uh, work, though. And I, I imagine what, what this talk is saying is ARM exploitation roadmap, but since he's talking about return-oriented programming, he called it ROP map. But um, not particularly net mobile network oriented or even mobile device oriented, it just happens that almost every single mobile device is an ARM. So this is very, although it's not specifically mobile, it's very uh, relevant to the mobile space. A uh, couple other talks, don't hate the player, hate the game, inside Android security patch lifecycle, that might be interesting. Vulnerabilities of wireless water meter networks. Now this one is not specifically like AT&T network specific, right? It's not like a GSM network specific. There's a lot of different wireless uh, technologies used to access water meters and things like that. However, there's been a lot of talk about like device to device and things like that, or machine to machine, M to M on, in our, on our mobility networks. And so while that's not specifically for us, it, it might be something that would be good for, for mo mobility operators to keep an eye on, just you know, lessons learned type of stuff. And then owning your phone at every layer, a mobility security panel. That one should actually be good. There's a whole uh, list of people on this panel, and they're all really smart guys. And so it might be interesting to see what, what they have to say. Now, that said, there's a whole bunch of other talks at Black Hat and at DEF CON immediately following, right? Black Hat's the 3rd of August. I think the first day is the 3rd of August. And then right after Black Hat is DEF CON. And, and DEF CON's a little bit more uh, edgy, shall we say. Mm -hmm. And so there'll be talks there as well. But um, uh, you know, a lot of these same talks will be at DEF CON as well. Maybe shortened, uh, but still, but still there. Yeah. The, so usually, the the more interesting ones that are more attacker oriented from Black Hat will get repeated at DEF CON. Right. But it, it it really just depends. The the one talk I have up here that I was reading about that you know doesn't really have anything to do with mobility networks or mobile phones or anything like that, which is sort of what I like playing with. But this was a very interesting talk, and it was talking about um, uh, essentially DNS attacks, right? But it was totally different. They were talking about bit flips. So you know that when, um, uh, you know, particles in our atmosphere hit your RAM, there's a chance that it'll flip a bit in the RAM, right? And you can even buy, like, expensive RAM that's, like, error-checking RAM, right? It has, like, CRCs on the words, or, you know, it actually checks for errors and catches these bit flips. And you'll find on expensive, more expensive servers, they'll, they'll have that type of RAM. But on our phones, on most of our PCs, on our laptops, we don't have error-checking RAM. We just have normal RAM. So when, when, when these 
bits get flipped from like, you know, whatever, uh, whatever particles flip bits. I, I'm drawing a blank right now. It's not photons, right? But, but particles like that, they can actually hit bits in our memory and change them. And so what this uh, guy did, which is just like an, a terribly simple idea, but incredibly brilliant to think about, what he did was he went out and got, went out on the internet and got a bunch of domain names that were similar to like, for example, att.com or microsoft.com, except that he flipped a bit in the name. So instead of an A, it was just like an A, but with one of the bits in the binary version of A flipped, right? And so that would actually, uh, it, it, it would get, so if for some reason somebody's memory was, was, uh, was messed up, yeah, and they would make a DNS query using these, this bad memory, it would actually still make it through uh, out onto the net. And, and uh, so they think they were going to Microsoft.com, but they were actually going to Microsoft.com with one bit flipped, and this guy actually had that domain out on the, uh, on the net. Anyway, I, incredibly interesting idea, just another good talk. Not really mobility-related, but still, there, there's going to be some good stuff at Black Hat, it looks like, this year. Wow, I never even knew that existed. That is, that is very, very interesting. Yeah, that is, that is, I, was, I wanted to go back. Uh, you, you said that there was one talk about the uh, wireless water meter networks. Um, there's a similar thing for the electric meters, right? And that may be more damaging than the uh, water meters. Yeah, I'm not sure why he chose water meters. I think he was talking about, like, it's, he's also, if I remember correctly, he's also talking about sort of attacks against, uh, you know, our water supply and what, what that looks like and what's gone on in the past, you know, and how we protect our water supply. So, I mean, it looked like an interesting overall talk. But the, the reason I wrote it down was I was like, well, you know, heck, we should keep an eye on this. If there's lessons learned about wireless networks, we should, you know, we should listen to that one. So. Right. But, yeah, I agree. Electricity sounds a little bit more dangerous. I don't know. We'll have to, yeah, we'll have to. around here, I live in San Diego, and we just recently um, all were converted to some new uh, electric meters that I think have all kinds of networking capabilities that, of course, the old ones didn't. And so I've been reading a lot about that because there's all kinds of issues around it, um, probably the same types of issues uh, this guy will be talking about, but with the water meters. So that, that would definitely be something interesting to, to see. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, uh, I think it's a great idea. There's nothing wrong with it. I mean, I can remember when I was little and you'd see the guy have to, he'd walk in your backyard to check to see how much electricity you've used, right? And that's like... Uh, so I guess we don't need meter readers anymore. Exactly, right. I mean, I think there, it's, it, it saves a lot of labor. It's a, lo a lot less expensive to do it this way. But, yeah, well, let's make sure yeah, that... I mean, if we can figure out how to do something, we might not have to pay our electric bills anymore. Right. Oh, yeah, we just have to <laughs> reply, right? If yeah, we could I would not... Reply back to it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know also if there's uh, some way of actually, you know, uh, controlling the meter and controlling the, the power that goes through it or something, you know, so on peak times, uh, you can get a reduction, and so maybe there's a way of hacking that or something. Yeah. I, I may be showing my age, but do any of you also remember, like, all the plans for, like, the beige boxes and the blue boxes? Yeah. And, and there, there was actually a box out there that you could get to, I mean, supposedly, see, I never tried it, and I wasn't about to try it. I didn't want to die from shocking myself, but supposedly you could get your meter to run backwards. So that was the one I was like, oh, I'd like to build that sometime. So. Well, yeah. you know, you could do that legitimately by getting some solar panels. Well, maybe not you, Josh, there in Seattle. It's not but... fun to do it legitimately anyway. Come on. <laughs> get enough solar panels, you'll make that meter run backwards. <laughs> right. Okay, uh, very good. Uh, thanks, Josh. Uh, let's move on now uh, to John with... Uh, Internet anomalies? All right, so yeah, we have a few uh, internet activity anomalies to go over uh, this week. Uh, I won't go over all of them. However, uh, a few that I wanted to point out here. Uh, let me make sure I have a good color for and a good size pointer. But we have some scanning activity on TCP destination port 23. We're going to talk about that real quickly. Um, we also have this one's a little curious to me. I didn't get a chance to look at this in detail, but scanning activity on TCP destination port 5631, 
and also on 1521. So we'll take a, a quick look at these and talk about what they are. Um, all of these are scanning activities. The other ones I'm, I'm not going to go over, though. So first off, 23 TCP scanning activity. You'll notice we, uh, this is, I believe, a uh, maybe two-week chart or something like that, uh, maybe even more. Uh, in any event, you can see we kind of have a, a, a noise floor here that's pretty low. But um, in the past couple of days, we've had some significant spikes in 23 TCP scanning uh, activity. 23 TCP is Telnet. Um, what we've observed is most of these are coming from Korea. In fact, a large majority of them are. Um, some probably 98% of them, uh, to, to be exact, of these, uh, these particular spikes are related to sources in Korea, uh, scanning for open Telnet machines. Um, not quite sure. We're still investigating this, if, whether it's a botnet or some other coordinated type of activity. Usually when you have massive types of scanning activity like this with large numbers of sources, it usually is botnet related. But since they're all in Korea, I don't know, we might need to look at that a little bit more closely to make sure it's not something we're not understanding properly. Um, what they might be scanning for, we've talked about this before, um, could be just machines that are on the Internet still running Telnet, which hopefully you don't have any out there that you know about. I would highly recommend switching to SSH, and if you're using SSH, uh, use uh, an updated patched version of it and maybe use uh, uh, certificates as well instead of just password authentication because there's lots of brute force password uh, guessers out there for us. What I was just thinking, uh, we, we talked, I think it was last week, about the, uh, maybe it was the week before, about the co.cc domain getting shut down. Mm -hmm. um, maybe they're just some angry, and that's out of Korea, maybe a bunch of angry people now. Uh, maybe. I, I wasn't, uh, I didn't see that segment from last week because I missed it. Uh, oh, that's right. You were not here. Yes. However, uh, I'd have to go back and take a look at that in more detail. <laughs> uh, generally speaking, I suspect, and this is totally a suspicion, that what they're really looking for here is um, like your home DSL routers, Linksys, uh, D-Links, et cetera. A lot of those expose Telnet interfaces for their administrative uh, consoles. Mm. Some of them, some especially older ones, expose those interfaces to the public internet facing side and not just to the internal side of your network. So uh, we know there's been a lot of botnets that do that. Now how would you know as a, uh, as a DSL user, say, or cable modem user, and that, you know, if you were to, that, that you had, say, TCP open to the world, not just internally? Um, well, there are a few ways. It's, pro it's pretty hard. However, there are some tools out there on the Internet that uh, some more reputable sites that will actually scan, uh, mm -hmm. kind of do a, a scan back at you and tell you what sources or what ports you have open on your, um, on your firewall. So that's one way that you could find out. Um, that's probably the only way, unless you have access to another machine out on the Internet that you could try to poke right. in again, right? Mm -hmm. um, okay, so that's that one. Uh, next one we have is uh, 1521 TCP scanning activity. We've seen lots of bubbles of this. We had a, a larger spike, um, I guess it was today actually, uh, but we see spikes of this all, all the time. Uh, this is for Oracle, uh, Oracle database server. There's lots of Oracle servers out on the Internet, publicly exposed. Probably don't recommend you do that. Um, but in any event, that's what they're looking for. They're probably, there might be, and I didn't go back to check, but there might be some new Oracle exploit out there that they're aware of, and now they're doing some reconnaissance to find Oracle servers out there that they might be able to use that exploit against. That would be my suspicion. Or they could be even just trying to get into them through brute forcing, password guessing, to maybe uh, get data off of them. Uh, we know that there's been lots of hacker gangs out there that do that. They, they target database servers in, in, um, uh, so that they can um, you know, ex exfiltrate data out of them. So, so uh, this graph isn't unique IPs then? It's just sort of any IP going to port 1520, 1521 TCP? That's and, correct. And what is count it? Okay, so this really could be a graph of brute forcing or of scanning. Right. Well, it's, it's more scanning because what we're attributing the scan activity to is where there's only a SIN packet in there. So with brute force, you tend to see lots of ACK and PUSH it, uh, flags in the flow, which wouldn't necessarily show up as scanning. Um, sc 
scanning yeah. usually has just a SIN packet because they're more often than not hitting something that doesn't respond. Uh, it's triggering off the first SIN packet. So it's possible that this is a graph of people brute forcing, but you wouldn't see that because you're only looking at the very first packet to do No, that's not true. We're looking at the whole flow, and the whole flow only has a SIN packet in it, right? Yeah. So, uh, so, so flows that only have a SIN packet in it, or usually three SIN packets because they'll try three times, okay. um, are ones that are scanning flows um, because they did not get a completed connection. Gotcha. So this definitely is scanning activity and not brute force activity. But brute force activity could go on after the scanning found something, I guess. And we do see that frequently, where they'll do reconnaissance, they'll scan, and then maybe a week later you'll see them specifically going to ones that actually responded and doing brute force types of attacks. I haven't seen it so much with Oracle, but certainly with Telnet, SSH, uh, those types of interactive services, they definitely do. Oh, and RDP a remote desktop protocol, they do that a lot as well. Uh, most of these are coming from China right now. In fact, it's only a very small number of sources in China um, doing this activity. So not as much as we had with the Telnet stuff on the previous slide. Um, this is only a handful of sources in China that are accounting for you know, several million flows an hour of uh, scanning activity. Uh, the last one is uh, this 5631 TCP, which as far as I could dig up, is PC Anywhere. I don't even know if PC Anywhere is used anymore. Um, however, this is a remote desktop type of software protocol. I need to do more digging around in this, but we're getting significant numbers of scans um, from a small number of sources in Singapore. Uh, you can see usually we don't get any hardly, hardly any scanning activity on this. I mean, there's big gaps of no activity whatsoever and some small spikes. We had large spikes in the 14, 15 million uh, scan flows per hour uh, for uh, extended duration here uh, today, actually. So probably need to take a closer look at this. I'm not quite sure, since it just happened today, right before the call, whether it really is PC Anywhere that they're targeting. Um, I would be a little surprised if that's the case. Well, you know what, John? I just I just checked, and Symantec owns PC Anywhere. Unless unless it's not the uh, the company we're thinking of, where we saw all those commercials a few years ago. And they just simply have a remote, um, a remote type of uh, software that they also called PC Anywhere. No, I think they did buy them way oh. back, many several years ago. I think you're right about that. Uh, so it could be some. Yeah, it looks like it's still around anyway. Yeah, it might still be around. Maybe they've uh, remarketed it under a new uh, title as well that I'm not aware of, but it's still on the same port and protocol. Um, in any event, we we'll probably need to take a closer look at that. I'm not aware. I would suspect that if there's a reason they're scanning for this, there might be some exploit that they know about, or they might be just trying to do some brute forcing, you know, do some reconnaissance, find machines that have this port open that look like they're these types of machines, and then try to break into them. Uh, these types of Telnet, SSH, VNC, remote desktop protocol, PC Anywhere, they are what these guys really want to find because it gives you full access to the machine really easily. Uh, plus, it gives you an interactive type of um, session with it. Uh, there's a, you, know, you don't necessarily need to have that. If you're smart and clever, you can exploit something else and get a shell pushed back to you. But uh, this makes it easy because they've already got the software on the client or the victim machine is already there. So uh, that's all I had for this week. OK. Well, thank you, John. Uh, that was uh, very informative. And uh, I want to thank, you know, John Hogeboom, Nancy Grover, Josh Lackey for uh, their contributions. I'm Dave Gross. And uh, remember, if you wanted to uh, send us feedback or if you had questions about the show, uh, you can uh, send them to cyberthreat at list.att.com. Um, the recordings are posted at uh, the techchannel.att.com website, and uh, there's also a podcast version, so you'd search iTunes for ATT Cyber Threat Report or find us on YouTube. Again, search for ATT Cyber Threat Report. So thank you, everyone, for viewing, and uh, we'll talk to you next week.